Good evening and welcome <clears throat> to tonight's uh, Human Relations Commission's presentation of Understanding and Appreciating the Native American Experience. Tonight's presentation is provided to us by the Coalition of Natives and Allies, and we are very excited to have them here and share all of their wonderful information with Middletown Township. So thank you so much for coming out tonight and giving us your time and attention. Okay, thanks. The Coalition of Natives and Allies would like to thank the Middletown Township Human Relations Commission and the Board of Supervisors for this important opportunity. We acknowledge that the land we occupy in Pennsylvania is the tribal territory of the Erie, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Muncie, Shawnee, Susquehannock. Please know that mentioning their names is only a beginning step to taking actions of support for the communities today. Nearly all, including the Lenape, were dispossessed, displaced, or killed by the 1700s. Because of this forced removal today, there are no state or federally recognized tribes in Pennsylvania. The violent trauma of land being stolen from indigenous people, the death, dispossession, and displacement of countless individuals, and much collective suffering has caused generational traumas which are deeply felt and experienced in indigenous communities. In New Jersey today, there are only three state-recognized tribes, the Nanakoke Lenni Lenape, Powhatan Renape, Ramapo Muncie Lenape Nation. There are also three federally recognized Lenape tribes that were forcibly relocated to Oklahoma and Wisconsin and two Lenape nations in Ontario, Canada. They mostly use the term Delaware. We'd like to briefly introduce ourselves. There's more information about us on our website, coalitionofnativesandallies.org. Halito, Sahichifo, Yat Donafan Boyle, Chata Micha Chalakisia. Hello, my name is Donna Fan Boyle. I am Choctaw and Cherokee, and I have two sons. I am one of the co-founders of the Coalition of Natives and Allies. I am a member in good standing of the American Indian Movement Central Texas. I am a co-director of American Indian Movement Woodlands Territory Support Group, and I live in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, where I hold a position on the Middletown Township Human Relations Commission. I am Ramona Urujaa Woods. I'm a Mohawk and a co-founder of CNA, the mother of two sons and I live in Reading, Pennsylvania. I'm the founder of the Little Blue Sky Foundation in support of Native American communities, as well as a member in good standing of the American Indian Movement Central Texas chapter and the American Indian Movement Woodlands Territory Support Group. Hahana um, Washte. My name is Kelly Bashu. I am Dakota Sioux, raised in Glenside, Pennsylvania, but now reside in Meadowbrook, Pennsylvania. I'm the mother of two daughters and two sons, and there's much more to my life story, which, will, which I will share with you later in the program. I'm a member of the American Indian Movement Woodlands Territory. Hi, my name is Linda Sarki. I'm an ally and co-founder of CNA, mother of a son of daughter, and executive director of the Kidsbridge Youth Center in New Jersey. For 20 years, we have created programs that deal with bullying prevention, anti-bias, empathy, respect, diversity, and accurate Native American history. I am from and live in New Jersey. My name is Arla Patch. I'm a co-founder of CNA and an ally who had the honor to serve on the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission for what happened to Native children in the child welfare system when I lived in Maine. I'm a grandmother and I live in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. In order to understand the issue of using Native American mascots for sports teams, it is essential to understand the historical context for taking those images. Most of us were never taught the true history, especially if you are not Native. Generations of school students have been armed with harmful misinformation and false narratives, which have laid the foundation for stereotyping and injustices. There is an abundance of research and studies that have shown the depth of harm this has caused for Native peoples. It's time for the truth to be taught so we can put an end to the widespread collective ignorance. We have a sheet of historical facts we cover in this program that can be downloaded after the presentation in the ch chat sidebar. So please don't feel you need, is that right? Yes. 
Okay, you need to take notes. The presentation is packed with information and we understand that it can feel overwhelming. Also in the chat bar will be six steps schools can take to actually honor Native Americans instead of using Native names and images as mascots. Please share these widely. And this is for the people who are watching by Zoom. And for those of you who are here, we'll have those sheets to take with you after the presentation. I'd like to remind all of us that Native peoples have inhabited this continent for more than 15,000 years. Archaeological evidence attests to this fact. As you can see from this map, original tribal communities did not conform to the rigid boundaries the European settlers had created. The proliferation of the original peoples of what we call Turtle Island was complex and widespread. This map represents the, reser the reservation lands today. In four centuries, there has been a 95 population decrease. Right from the line. Right from the very start, Native people were considered savages and not the same as the European settlers. Quote, merciless Indian savages, unquote, is in the Declaration of Independence. Also included in this document, quote, all men were created equal, unquote. And we now understand that refers to white landowning men. 40 years before Columbus sailed, Pope Nicholas V put out proclamations known as the Doctrine of Discovery. If you arrive on a foreign land and the inhabitants are not Christian, then they are enemies of Christ. And you can, quote, capture, vanquish, and subdue the Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ put them in perpetual slavery, take all their possessions and poverty, end quote. And you might think that this was only valid a long time ago, but I'm sorry to tell you that in 2005, the Supreme Court ruled against the Oneida with the doctrine of discovery cited in the footnote for the ruling and also disappointing it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg who delivered that opinion of the court. Speaking of Christopher Columbus, who never landed in North America, something else we were not taught is the genocidal and barbaric way he treated the indigenous people in the islands where he landed. Some of his acts were to burn native people alive, rape children, cut off limbs, and he used torture and enslavement. These atrocities were documented in the diaries of a Spanish priest who accompanied him, Bartholomé de las Casas, who witnessed these acts for us today. From the beginning, our country has had deliberate policies for the destruction of Native peoples. A painful example is the 1755 bounty on the heads of the Penobscot Indians in Maine, known as the Spencer Phipps Proclamation. The payoff was 50 pounds for an adult male. That is one year's salary for clergy at the time. In the proclamation, in the proclamation text, you can see that it enumerates that there was also an amount for women and there was even an amount for children under the age of 12. It's important to understand that there were bounties all over the United States. You'll be able to check on the information sheet to see the bounty that was in this area. Bounties were highly profitable and they provoked widespread murder of indigenous people all over the continent. In the 1850s, the California native population was reduced by two thirds in one decade through bounty killing. And in order to prove the more valuable male scalp, they were required to present genitalia with the scalp. Scalps were called redskins. Do all sports fans know this barbaric fact for the meaning of the word redskins? Native peoples are the most heavily legislated against in the history of our country. Every single treaty made with Native Americans has been broken. We want to mention just four of many laws that have impacted Native peoples and unalienable rights. Please refer to the information sheet for more details. The Civilization Fund Act of 1819, 
In the 1830 Indian Removal Act, widely known as the Trail of Tears, there were multiple trails of tears that negatively impacted nearly all tribes east of the Mississippi. Smallpox infected blankets were widely distributed as an extermination tactic and deliberate biological war warfare used against natives. This letter from Colonel Boquette to General Amherst details the distribution of such blankets and clothing to quote, inoculate the Indians. Lord Jeffrey Amherst approved and said, quote, to try every method that can extirpate, meaning destroy or completely, this execrable race, execrable meaning extremely bad or unpleasant. The Dawes Act of 1887 that took 93 million acres of nat out of native control, President Theodore Roosevelt said the Dawes Act is the mighty pulverizing engine to destroy the tribal mass. Native people were assaulted from every angle and the one thing that would be our lifeline was our spiritual practices and they were outlawed in 1882. Although this country was founded on religious freedom, it is evident that the persecuted now became the persecutors. Until 1978, after 96 years, this order was finally lifted with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act due to the efforts of the American Indian Movement. Another, another damaging and disempowering policy, one of the truths that brought great shock and grief to me was voting. Another area of astounding fact. Did you know that Native people were not given the right to vote until 1954? That's after I was born. And in every state, not until 1962. This is particularly outrageous when you consider that Native people served in disproportionately high numbers in every military conflict since the beginning of this country even helping win World War I and World War II with the code talkers, they died serving a country that denied them the right to vote. In 1948, the UN defined genocide, quote, an act or acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Let's highlight two sections in the 1948 document of the articles on the screen. Let's take the first one, Article 2, Section A, killing members of the group. Here's a very small sample of Native massacres for you. Clear Lake Massacre, 1850, 200 killed. Sand Creek Massacre, 1863, 230 murdered. Wounded, Cree, Wounded Knee Massacre, 1890, 300 killed. Bear River Massacre, 1863, 400 killed. In Article 2, Section E, quote, forcible transfer of children of one group to another group. This is what the Maine Truth Commission and residential skills are all about. We must recognize that our government has engaged in all of these. Great harm, from, great harm has resulted from remaining ignorant of and silent about these painful facts of our shared history with Native peoples. So let's take a breath and let this sink in. We have a lot to absorb. In the 1940s, the U.S. government talked about Indian policy for liquidation of Native peoples. Given that 11,000 were liquidated in World War II, they changed that language to termination policies. In 1956, the government passed the Indian Relocation Act as one of these policies. This act moved 30,000 Native Americans into cities it was another attempt, yet another attempt, to quote, solve what the government saw as their quote, Indian problem. Natives were manipulated with unkept promises of vocational training, education, and housing. Native Americans had difficulty assimilating into white mainstream society, resulting in an increase in poverty, alcoholism, and loss of culture and traditions. The lasting and damaging effects of this 
is that Native Americans today have the highest unemployment rates and the highest poverty rates in this country. Would it surprise you that 71% of Native Americans living today now live in urban areas? In July of 1968 in Minneapolis, the American Indian Movement was founded as an advocacy group to address the problem of police brutality and generations of inequality and inequity. In 1978, AIM organized a 3,000 mile march from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. to present the 20 point proposal of the Trail of Broken Treaties to President Nixon. Nixon would not meet with them. Although as a result, Congress did pass the previously mentioned American Indian Religious Freedom Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA, which tries to protect tribes to keep their children. In order to fully grasp the significance of this next piece of our history, I ask you to imagine the government taking away your children and grandchildren under the threat of imprisonment or the, and or the elimination of subsidies. This practice of taking Native children away from their families has continued for Native children through adoption and foster care, with ICWA as the only law to protect them. To trace the historical thread for why we need a truth and reconciliation is to address this in every state with tribal nations. We need to go back to the 1800s. And by the way, our Interior Department, our Interior Department Secretary, Deb Halland, has just created a commission to investigate the U.S. boarding school error. Colonel Richard Henry Pratt led the, led the shift in official policy from violence and conquest to the policy of genocidal assimilation of Native children into the white culture. The flagship school of forced assimilation created by Pratt was the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and their motto was kill the Indian in him and save the man. Policies of assimilation are policies of cultural genocide and a deliberate systematic destruction of our culture. Carlisle was the model for over 450 Indian residential schools all over the United States and Canada. Hundreds of thousands of students passed through those doors. Children were taken as young as four and were required to stay until the age of 16 to 18 to ensure that they give up their, quote, savage beliefs. Many never went home in the summer but were sent out as free labor to work on farms. Many died at the schools or were not, re or not, or were not returned to the correct tribe and those that did no longer spoke the language and remembered little of their tribal culture they lost connection to their parents and their families. Overall, 150,000 children in Canada and hundreds of thousands of Native children in the United States were removed from their homes. Arriving at Indian residential schools, they took away their clothing and sacred traditional possessions. They cut off their hair, doused them with DDT powder, a carcinogenic pesticide, and they were forbidden to speak their language or they would have their mouths washed out with lye. They were forbidden to communicate with their siblings. Children were also abused physically, spiritually, emotionally, and sexually. Over 1,000 children died at the Carlisle School alone. Residential schools reached their peak in the 1970s in the US, and the last residential school was closed in Canada in 1996. Native children died at alarming rates at these schools through neglect, disease, inadequate food, and unsatisfactory medical care. Unmarked and mass graves at the sites of these schools are just starting to be discovered with ground penetrating radar. Here you see graves marked at a school in Canada. With the loss of homelands, way of life, our means of survival, our autonomy, and the massacres of Indian people, the assault to every aspect of our existence has created a wound to the mind, body, and spirit. This intergenerational wound passed from one generation to the other experienced a devastating blow when they took our children. Historical intergenerational trauma is compounded when society pretends this his history never happened. One of the children taken was Michael Gayonhade by the Brook Day. 
<clears throat> excuse me, my grandfather. He was born in Gunawage, Quebec, Canada in 1896. I was in college when I took this photograph of him shortly before he took his final journey in 1990 at the age of 95. When I look at the faces of these children in this photograph, I notice their expressions. There is no semblance of childhood joy. I see fear and sadness. As a woman who has raised two men, this photo breaks my heart. The smallest boy in the front and center of this photograph is my grandfather at an unknown age and date. He appears to be between six and eight years old, placing the photo around 1902 to 1904. The photograph was taken at the St. Peter Claver School for Boys, a Spanish Indian residential school operated by the Jesuits. In the early 1900s, it was known as the Wikwimikong Boys Industrial School of Manitoulin Island, Ontario. Opening in 1838, its mission was to assimilate First Nations children from the ages of six, or from, I'm sorry, excuse me, from First Nations children from the ages of four to 16. Many of my elders have spoken of the malnutrition and the physical and sexual abuse that took place there. Although my grandfather never spoke of what was done to him in the years he lived there, I do know that he was abused during that time. He told us that it was so bad that he and a few other boys risked everything to try and run away back to their families. They hopped a train headed east back towards Gunawage. They were caught. He said they were physically punished so severely to ensure that they wouldn't run away again. At the time that Michael Day was released and returned back to Gunawage, he had no family left to care for him. Both of his parents had died during the time that he had been gone. He and his parents were robbed of ever having the opportunity for having a relationship. For a time, he roamed the Gunawage streets as a homeless orphan. Eventually, he was taken in by the kindness of the Phillips family who raised him and cared for him. In spite of all this, he made a life for himself. I ask each of you to search in your heart and consider how it might feel to know that the child in this photograph with all that he had gone through was your beloved grandfather. The, the Dakota 38 plus two was the largest mass execution in our country's history, ordered by President Abraham Lincoln. Although a military tribunal had sentenced 303 Dakota men to death, Lincoln commuted it, down, commuted it down to the 38 plus two who were hanged the next day. The evidence against the Dakota was spare, the tribunal biased, and the defendants were unrepresented, many not even speaking English. My relatives have participated in the annual commemorative Dakota 38 plus two ride on horseback. The UN definition of genocide, Article 2, Section D, quote, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group, unquote. As many as 70,000 Native women were sterilized by coercion or without their consent during the 60s, 70s, and 80s at the hand of the US government. It was called the Family Planning Services and Population Research Act of 1970, and that created the premise. Sometimes women were told that their benefits would stop if they didn't consent, or that it would be reversed, it could be reversed, or they were given papers to sign while under sedation. When investigated, the government said they did it to alleviate poverty. As mentioned earlier, as a result of the longest walk by the American Indian Movement, Congress enacted the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978, known as ICWA. This act codified higher standards of protection for Native American children. ICWA recognized, one, in Native culture, a child has three parents, mother, father, and the tribe. Number two, in the best interest of Native children, it is in the best interest of Native children to be placed in Native homes. And three, it is in the best interest of a tribe for its own survival for children to stay in their communities. In the 1950s, 35% of Native children were still taken from the tribes nationwide. 
Between 1958 and 1967, the taking of Native children expanded into adoption, like the Indian Adoption Program, to try to prove that Native children were better off with white families. In Canada, it was known as the, quote, the 60s scoop. Thousands of Indigenous children were taken from their families, adopted by white families in Canada and the United States, losing their names, their language, and then a connection to their heritage. I was one of those Native babies who, in 1963, at the age of three months, was adopted by a white couple, and my new parents signed papers committing to raise me in the Catholic religion. My adoptive parents thought they couldn't conceive a child, but my adoptive parents went on to have five biological children who I grew up with as my sisters and my brother. At the age of 50, I started to search for my birth family. I'm happy to say that I found them living in Sisseton, South Dakota, and then part of the Sisseton, Wapiton, Oyate, Lake Travis Reservation in South Dakota. I am the eighth of nine siblings and the only one who had been adopted out. My father passed in 1988, and I was lucky to have eight years with my mom. Sadly, she took her journey to Spirit World in January of 2022 at the age of 96. My whole life, though I knew I was loved, I never felt like I quite belonged. It may be a difficult concept to understand, but when I found in my birth family, everything fell into place. On the very first day of meeting my mom, we went to a very sacred ceremony called Sundance. As I watched my sister dance, I knew this is where I belonged, and I am proud and honored to say that I am now a sun dancer. This is the year that I brought all four of my children to finally meet their grandmother, their Kushi, and we're all members of a proud Dakota family. In Maine, in 1984, the rate of taking children was 19 times higher than other states and children were being taken without notification to the tribe as required by the ICWA law. It was these rates of taking Native children and the lack of compliance with ICWA that led to the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Maine, the first one in the country. These are the tribal chiefs and the governor of Maine at the signing ceremony. The Truth Commission in both Canada and Maine have been a good start to acknowledging the atrocities an attempt to begin a healing process. ICWA only applies to citizens of federally recognized tribes. In New Jersey, because it's not a federally recognized tribe, Nanakoke Lenny Lenape Chief Mark Gould often has to deal with disrespect from judges who show little concern or courtesy because they are not bound by ICWA for state tribes. In New Jersey, Native people experience racism and denial of their existence on many levels, including the public schools. This is Chief Perry of the Ramapo Munsi Lenape in Northern New Jersey. Oftentimes, a Native person is dismissed if they don't fit the archaic, stereotypical vision of an Indian based on an inaccurate history that is taught in schools and learned from television and movies. The tribal leader for the Powhatan Renape Nation who recently passed away was Reverend Roy Running Stream Bundy. At one point, almost 90% of the population of Morrisville, New Jersey were Powhatan Renape people. The legacy of genocide has left native communities with the highest rate of socioeconomic distress in the country. These statistics on chronic diseases, unemployment, suicide, homicide, police shootings, missing and murdered women, substance abuse, etc., do not reflect who we are, but what has happened to us since first contact and how the government has continued to fail us. Native Americans have on average a life expectancy that is five years less than all other races in the United States population. And it can range to as much as 25 years less in some areas of the country. Land, water, hunting, and fishing rights continue to be a struggle for Native people in this country today. The Penobscot Reservation is made up of several islands in the Penobscot River, and the reservation has always included the river, their source of food, with fishing. Regardless, the state of Maine has been trying to take away the river as part of their reservation. In addition to the statistics mentioned, these are only a few of the current issues faced by Indigenous peoples. Uranium mine poisoning, voter suppression, underfunded health care, non-potable water and lack of indoor plumbing or electricity, inadequate educational system, poor housing, 
oil pipelines, murdered and missing Native women and men, illness from atomic bomb testing, loss of tribal lands, and broken treaties. From the doctrine of discovery origins to manifest destiny, which is what I was taught in fifth grade, we saw nature and her resources as a commodity. This is the conqueror mentality. So we, referring to white Euro-Americans, we took what we wanted and we did anything it took to get the original people out of the way. And notice the angelic nature of this taking depicted in this famous painting. The truth is we, white people, took their land, culture, and languages. We took their resources. We killed their people who were in our way. And then we took their children. And the latest version of that mentality is that we take their identity and individual tribal cultures and replace them with stereotyped caricatures and racial slurs, and then we tell them that it honors them. We take away their identity with mascots, using it for our own entertainment, and then we have the arrogance to tell them what it means. As a white woman of European settler descent, this history has brought up intense emotions for me. Guilt, sadness, shock, shame, very deep grief, and anger that I wasn't taught all of this. What I found that I can do is to use those emotions to fuel and create change, change in my own thinking, my own behavior, to share these truths with others and under Native leadership, under Native leadership, take action. When you reduce a people to sports mascots, you take away their equality. They are not the same as other people and do not require the same respect. This profoundly affects policy, which impacts Native communities. With many mascots being animals, you put them on the same level as an animal, not a human. Redskins, braves, raiders, warriors, all these monikers are disrespectful and harmful to all of our youth. In, nine, in, in 2005, the American Psychological Association called for the immediate retirement of all Ameri American Indian mascots, symbols, images, and personalities by schools, colleges, universities, athletic teams, and other organizations. Extensive peer-reviewed research has found that exposure to Native American sports mascots increases a student's negative stereotyping of other races, which leads to even more discrimination. Is this what we want to teach our kids? This is the very absurdity at the heart of the issue. Non-Native children take an Indian identity while Native children had their identity beaten out of them. This history makes it unconscionable that non-Native students play Indian today. Normally, we would not use the racial slur redskins. Instead, we would say the R word. Webster's Learner's Dictionary defines it as a degrading derogatory term for Native peoples which should be avoided. For the sake of context in this presentation, we will be using the full word that for us evokes the equivalent of the N word. At the Neshaminy High School in Bucks County, the student body has been taught for generations that it is acceptable to make a mockery of and to bastardize our culture. This provo provokes disrespectful behavior and is one way in which systematic racism gets perpetuated by teaching it to our youth. A native headdress is earned by a tribal community member over a long period of time made by other members of the community as a sacred honor. Each time the person did an act of bravery or service for the tribe, they earned a feather which was added. It is a great distinction to wear one and an honor that is earned. Instead, we have taught our children during early childhood education to trivialize Native culture. As you see here, a student who thinks an honorary tribal custom is merely a costume. School boards create and revise discrimination and harassment policies to protect all minorities. 
Promotion of race-based native mascot tree keeps natives as the only minority not protected under school board policies. Why is that? Native Americans are the only minority where race-based discrimination is tolerated. There would never be another minority used in this degrading way. Nationwide acceptance of native mascotry trivializes the verbal and physical assaults against those who stand against it. We are told that we must accept this false honor or get over it. Two Pennsylvania districts still use the racist epithet redskins and four Pennsylvania districts have just voted to end the use of their Native American mascots, even with the issues of the pandemic affecting their districts. They were Radnor, Unionville, Allentown, and Susquehannock. There are nearly 2,000 schools nationwide with Native mascots. Would anyone feel honored by this? The hypersexualization of Native women has encouraged the higher rates of violence and murder. The U.S. Department of Justice found that American Indian women face murder rates that are more than 10 times the national average. The CDC states that murder is the leading cause of death among Native American women. One in three Native women reports have been raped during their lifetime. Generations of indigenous activists, scholars, and community members have worked tirelessly to persuade the Washington Redskins professional football team to change the name and imagery. Recently, the incredible momentum around the Black Lives Movement Matter movement, along with threats of defunding by their sponsors, created that final push that we needed to finally convince the team to change. Nishamani, along with other schools, held Washington up as an excuse for hanging on to their own race-based native mascotry. But now this needs to be the start of a chain reaction. All, the, uh, all of the other professional college, high school, and elementary school sports that still use the Indian mascot. Tax dollars should not be used to support educational institutions which promote discrimination, racism, stereotypes, harassment, and bullying. When we know better, we should do better. It is widely recognized in society that blackface is unacceptable. However, there is a disparity for red face. This is the mascot, Chief Ili Nawick, performing a mocking native dance. The University of Illinois ended this in 2007. Many schools created their native mascots about 100 years ago at a time when native people were highly discriminated against in our country and had no voice. Many tried to hide that they were native while schools were proud to misappropriate that identity and culture for their own entertainment. For Donna, who, as you know, is a mother and a resident of the Neshaminy School District, this fall it will be a 10th year ongoing battle to get the school board to understand how wrong it is to have a Native American mascot in an educational setting. She has experienced horrific media, social media attacks, cyberbullying, and threats of physical violence from some of the members of the community. Finally, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission had to take over the case. Donna presented educational materials, studies, and research 16 times to the Neshaminy School Board. However, they have spent nearly $500,000 of taxpayer money to keep that mascot. Donna has been individually working on this now for nearly a decade, but in Indian country, they have been speaking up about this issue since the 1960s. In, Jan in January of 2020, the Coalition of Natives and Allies, CNA, was created as a resource to educate communities and assist school districts in making a transition to non-race-based mascots and logos. Our educational programs are unique in that they represent both native and non-native voices in partnership. Several schools in Pennsylvania have reached out to us in recent months and are welcoming education and change. We are also working with the Pennsylvania legislature to introduce legislation to end Native American mascots in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and support teaching accurate Native American history. 
Not only is our website a source of information, but also where you can join our mailing list. If you're interested in this issue, please join the mailing list to stay informed of our progress. Here you see Molly and Dana, who is now the Penobscot ambassador in front of the school board for Maine's Skowhegan School District. Hers is a powerful story of success, uh, of a successful fight to end native sports mascots in Maine. Please see her compelling TED Talk on our website. The levels of foster care and adoption of native children are still very high today. In South Dakota, the native population is 13.5%, but native children are in foster care at a rate of 54%. The story of Native American history you just heard is not well known. That is why so many people don't understand how a Native American mas mascot is hurtful. By witnessing the murder of George Floyd, America's awakening to the injustices that have been present all along. We empower all of you to be both allies and teachers, sharing what you learned this evening. The time has come to be in compliance with the values of our country aspires to stand for. Healing and building community requires we have a common understanding of our shared history. The non-Native population has benefited and continues to benefit from the fact that Native people were targeted for destruction. Sharing this truth is the work of healing our country. This is the 50-foot statue entitled Dignity in South Dakota. In spite of all this history that we've shared with you, please know that the resilience of the indigenous peoples of this land is strong. Among Native peoples, there is a movement of reclaiming our languages, ceremonies, and traditions, food sovereignty, identity, and healing from residential schools. Working together, we can work toward the healing, healing this history that we've both inherited and in partnership, write a different ending. From the inaugural poet, Amanda Gorman, America is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. I just want to point out that that is Ramona standing down at the bottom of that, the woman who you see up there on the Zoom. And not only questions, but we're very much open to um, reactions, comments, um, expressing feelings. <laughs> Anyone who's Zooming in, if you could put your questions in the sidebar, um, we'll do our best to try to um, answer those. So while we're waiting, here's another fact, not in our presentation, is that in New Jersey, there are 76 Native American sports mascots, and in Pennsylvania, there are 63. 63. So we have a lot of work to do because our children, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania are learning the wrong thing. One stereotype encourages another. We have a lot of work to do. And Vermont just recently um, uh, passed. passed legislation to uh, do away with all native sports mascots. That was last week, I believe. Sorry, yes. Vermont? Yes. Maine was the first, was that right? Yep. Yeah. But then we've got Colorado. I think Oregon, California has a limited one. Um, not sure, there's a handful. But Colorado's was just, um, somebody was trying to uh, do something against it. Not, oh, and, and they, they lost their case. And they lost their case. Yeah, <laughs> and Colorado's is so, strong that they're actually going to fine schools financially who don't make it by the deadline that they've given them, which I think might be next fall, but right. um, it's in the works in New York State. We've been in touch with folks there. Um, we're working on it with Rep Rab. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, uh, what about Minnesota? Minnesota. Repeat for people listening. What was the question they can't hear? What about Minnesota? Oh, Minnesota. Yeah. So I'll repeat her question. She said how hard it is as in, the, in the audience to hear this information, but she also wanted to know 
how we do self-care in having to say it over and over. And I want to absolutely defer to Donna, Ramona, and Kelly first on that. Well, um, it's hard to hear over and over again. And I prepare myself, but it still takes me a few days to, um, you know, to feel somewhat decent. Um, and it, you know, it starts to feel like people don't really care, you know, um, because this history hasn't been taught and people just want to remember what they've been taught in school. They don't want to hear the hard facts. Um, but it is hard to deal with it, you know, over and over and over again. And, and I mean, it's not only us talking about it to audiences, but we have to go over the script, you know, and, and we, you know, we, we do this presentation for different groups, you know, we did it for fourth graders, so we had to go over the script and tone it down for fourth graders, you know, um, we've done it for colleges, for teachers, um, you know, but yeah, it's, it's hard to, to feel better afterwards. Um, it's been hard for me because I grew up in, in not in a Native community. Um, I did not meet another Native American until I was 50 years old and I met my family, which is very hard for me to even comprehend sometimes. So, you, you know, if you look at your culture and, and never meeting somebody who look like you is just, to me, a, a crime. Um, when I hear these things, it still makes me cry. <laughs> when I hear, like, you know, and I see that picture of those um, handcuffs, you know, just for little kids, it just, and, and the fact, like, what Donna, what Donna was just saying is, like, it seems like nobody cares. Like, how can you see those pictures? How can you see those pictures of those lights and know that there are children under there and not care? It's just really hard for me sometimes. So I like light sage and I say prayers <laughs> to my ancestors and um, that helps a lot, you know, because well, people tell me that my family survived. My parents, my, both my parents were full, you know, full-blooded Dakota and their parents were and their parents were. So they had to go through a lot. I mean, they were moved off the reservation. Um, that's the main reason why I was the only one who was put up for adoption because when they were moved, they just did not, everybody was, my all nine kids, or eight at the time, nobody was together. Every, some were in boarding schools. Um, they had moved my parents to Chicago. Um, so it was very hard for them at that moment. Um, so it's, it was, it's just a hard, it's just hard to hear all these, all these things that I, even being Native American, did not know. I did not know a lot of this. And um, it's come quite as shocking. You know, it's very shocking to me to hear it now. But. Also for you, Kelly, to grow up with two identities, like suddenly you get a new identity when you're 50 years old. Can you imagine? And like, who are you when you're in two worlds? That's, that's that rough. Is, yeah, that, that is hard because, it, it's almost like, because in my thing, I was raised Catholic, and they in my adoption papers it says I must be raised Catholic. I have to go to Catholic elementary schools, high school, and colleges. And when I found this all out, I, I could not be Catholic anymore. I do not go to church anymore. And when I found out about the residential schools, and it was very hard for me to, to stop going. But I had to be who I really am. And now like that I do our ceremonies and I go back a lot, I sage every day, I say prayers. Um, that's my healing. That's what, I, well, that's what I do to heal, definitely. And another hard thing is that when we, you know, we belong to a lot of groups and, and Facebook pages where we work on these mascot issues. And when we speak the truth to these, to, to the communities, and we just give them the facts to educate them to hope that they would go, oh, well, you know, we didn't know this, so maybe we need to do something better. And instead, most of the time we hear, well, we're honoring you. And then we say, well, we're not honored. 
well, you should be honored, but we're not honored. And then it gets to the point where it comes down to, well, we are the winners. We chased you all out and we own this place now and we own your identity and you lost. And so now we get to say what we do with you. And from a community, you know, especially my own community, which I, you know, I was always present in my son's school, you know, in elementary school and middle school. And then when it got to high school and I brought up the question about the mascot, and from the time that I opened my mouth, like I was respected before that people, you know, their children came to my house and played. My house was the place where everybody was safe. And then after that, it was threats, you know, no, but I had to, not even let people know who my child was because I didn't know what was gonna happen to him. And he, you know, and and it was, you know, all of a sudden people didn't like me anymore, you know, and I had to, you know, separate myself from my own child so that, you know, people wouldn't take it out on him. Um, and he did have um, experiences in school where things happened and, um, it wasn't very nice, uh, but yeah. Ramona, would you like to answer that question also? Yes, um, I would like to just, you know, as far as how I, how it affects me and how I handle it, um, you know, the story that I told about my grandfather, it's, it can be very hard for me to tell but what people need to understand is that since the last school closed in 1996, that there are people in my generation who are out there who are victims of this, um, who were taken to residential schools away from their families. Uh, and my, father, my grandfather's story seems so far removed because we're looking at a picture that was taken in the early 1900s. But in any Native community, in any Native person that you know, someone in their family was, was taken away. Someone, you know, my, my aunts, my uncles, my grandmother, my grandfather, you know, it's, it's, it's so prevalent. It's not such a rare story. Mine is not an uncommon story. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to share that. And uh, I could uh, speak as a white woman. Um, I've done a ton of crying, a ton of crying. And I had all those years in Maine working on the Truth Commission. And the very first night before I was going to meet on Indian Island and sit down with indigenous people for the first time in my life, I just had this incredible from the bottom of my belly cry and I was so glad I got it out because what native people don't need is white people's tears um, and, and our, our issues. But what I'm saying is it's really good to metabolize all of that so that you can um, keep going. And there have been times when I've done this script and it's been now, um, yeah, 12, 2012. So it's been 10 years that I've been saying this. Um, but when Kelly spoke tonight, I was really choked up hearing her words again and seeing those images and imagining how amazing that would be to find her birth mother. Um, it's just incredibly moving. Um, but the guilt, I mean, I found out from my cousin that we had people from Holland that came over in the 1640s and they had a farm where the World Trade Center is. That's Lenape territory. I mean, I just feel like I carry in my blood a history that really needs to be um, accounted for. And the best that I can do is just be really honest and share this as much as I can and give other Euro-Americans permission to feel those feelings. Because if you push them away, then you're denying the healing. It's like you gotta go in the swamp to walk out through it and get to the other side. Um, but. I still definitely feel the feelings. So uh, briefly, I just want to share with you, I, I f grew up in this country feeling like the other for that my religion was different than most people's. But when I met Arla um, six years ago and I watched a movie about this, my, my feelings were of anger 
and resentment. How is it possible in this country that I'm 62 years old and I'm learning the truth about our history and, and these myths and, and the disservice? We, I, I'm a youth educator in New Jersey. And so this makes me, it made me so angry and upset, and I think you made me cry, but it was an opening of really betrayal and anger. The American educational system, it can be developmentally appropriate, but we need to start teaching our children the truth. In New Jersey and Pennsylvania, both in fourth grade, we teach, you know, about, you know, culture and different tribes, and I, I, I think we learned about teepees, which there's no teepees in New Jersey, maybe in the plains, right? So these myths that we, we just perpetuate um, my feeling was of anger. So again, youth education, that our children to grow up to be more respectful and learn what happened in a develop, developmentally appropriate way. And I would also just really encourage everyone here tonight to take the handouts with you. And even if you just share with one person in your home that there was this thing called the Doctrine of Discovery, or if you just share that Native people couldn't vote until 1954, um, or you know, I sit next to somebody on a plane and they're gonna hear some of this history, the more you share it, the more people that know it, the closer we can get to healing in this country. So you're all teachers. Okay. I think there was a lot of information in there that probably many of us didn't know. I know in the Human Relations Commission, um, these wonderful ladies up here actually gave us some information prior to tonight's presentation. Um, I know as uh, the HRC met, we were um, dumbfounded with some of the information that was presented that you know we, we had no idea. Um, so that's why we felt it necessary to, to share with everyone. Um, it's certainly a lot of information there. Um, I just wanted to, one, thank you all very much for coming tonight and sharing your stories and, and the information uh, with our community. Uh, this presentation tonight uh, was videotaped um, and recorded, so it will be um, on the uh, Middletown Township website so that we can absolutely use that as a tool moving forward, um, and it'll be there for others to be able to share and, and to educate and, and to learn as well, which is, which is wonderful. Um, I also wanted to let everyone know that the Human Relations Commission is going to be doing a book club this summer, and the first book that we're going to be doing is called There, There. Um, so there's more information on the website regarding the book club, so please feel free to um, reach out. Um, on the website, there's information on how you can join. We would love to have as many people as possible participating um, during the summer. Um, so please, make sure you go to the, the website. Yes, I think you were holding up the, the pamphlet. So the information will be on the website for everyone. Um, so it would be great. We'd love to have um, you know, people reach out and, and, and you know, be a part of our group for that. So once again, thank you very much for coming out tonight and, and giving us.